Hello and welcome back to another special edition of Austin's American Flyer as we continue our series looking at the transition that AC Gilbert made from three rail to two rail today on Austin's American Flyer. specifically on freight cars. There happen to be seven that we're going to look at and of those seven, most of them look pretty much identical in two rail as they did in three rail. But again, there are some variations to that. And then they also talked a little bit about some of their new true model cars. And again, these were available as a kit that you could assemble and paint. Uh, I thought it's also interesting that they specify that you have to have a larger radius track, which uh, they also had a smaller radius track, and these cars wouldn't, wouldn't work around that. So pretty interesting stuff. In 1939, American Flyer introduced a true model tank car. This was a 3 16th scale O-gauge car that came in the road number 512 and uh, had decals for Texaco on the side. You could buy this car ready to run for $4 or as a kit number K512 for $3. These cars appeared to be from the factory with a metallic silver but there's a gray and yellow painted version that have also been found. The tank car chassis is interesting because it is used for not only the tank car, but the gondola, the box car, the cattle car, and the rucking crane. In 1946, the chassis were used for S scale, and the number became a 625. But uh, these tank cars were new and were made out of plastic and they were a little bit shorter. Uh, but the chassis, it was discovered, warped pretty quickly, pretty, pretty badly. So later in 46 and 47, um, they changed the chassis to a cast metal. Um, what's also interesting is the pre-war trucks had a rivet that mounted from the bottom, whereas the S gauge mounted from the top. The gondola. In 1939, a true model 316th O gauge gondola was released. It was die cast and came in LNE road lettering. And uh, it tended to be a very nice, uh, nice car. Um, had good coloring. Uh, the applied rubber stamping was done with silver paint, and the Lay New England decal herald was very nice, uh, nice uh, piece as well. Very colorful. Included a two-piece brake wheel. The 504 gondola is a pre-war item that did not get carried over uh, to the S gauge lineup per se. In other words, there were enough changes made when the S-scale version was brought out that you really, really can't say that one morphed into the other. The style of the gondola body was changed for the 46 S-scale. It became a single piece of plastic. Our uh, well-known 631 TNP gondola is a prime example of this. Um, it was also interesting that the new S-scale shell or body of the gondola was actually longer than the pre-war O scale. Uh, the side ribs are different uh, from pre to post and there is no brake wheel on the S scale version. In 1939 a true model number 514 wrecker car was released. Uh, I'm going to call this a crane, a steam crane, because that's to me what it looks like. This model was die cast and was stuck on the tank car chassis. And the 514 was available as a ready to run 
uh, car at for five dollars and fifty cents or if you wanted to assemble it as yourself the kit number k514 was available for four dollars and fifty cents the 514 uses the house and boom on a slightly different base than was used on the new 583 electromagnetic crane accessory that was also listed in 1939 however that was for six dollars and 95 cents so for a dollar 45 more you got an electric motor a reverse unit a magnet and an operating button versus the rail car the cab and boom are mounted to the center of the chassis with a machine screw through cab and a friction belt secured with a nut on the bottom side of the chassis there's a paper american flyer label on the bottom of the crane base the crane cab and boom carried over into s gauge production in 1946 but these were mounted to a new longer s gauge flat car chassis known commonly as a number 635. in 1939 american flyer offered a true model 316th o gauge die cast box car numbered in 506 lettered for the baltimore and ohio railroad this car came painted white with a Tuscan brown roof and ends. It also included stamped steel opening doors and a two-piece brake wheel. The car body was mounted on our very well-known die-cast tank car chassis. And there were four shell pins on the corners that were staked with an X-tool to hold everything together. The car was followed up in 1946 with a new all plastic version that used a separate solid floor chassis with simulated wood floor that was also made from plastic the number as well changed and became 633 the new s scale car had white sides with tuscan brown painted roof and ends just like its pre-war number 506 predecessor it had opening doors and a two-piece brake wheel also one of the interesting things you see in the catalog here is these new plastic cars were toted as being three times less weight, which meant you could pull longer trains. Unfortunately, these plastic chassis and boxcar shells worked very badly, and so the chassis was soon replaced with solid die casts with a simulated wood floor. As far as the weight ratio, while the picture shows a three to one, in reality, uh, it was more like a two to one. The last photo shows the bottom of a painted shell from a K506 kit. This shows the cast corner pins have never been staked. Unfortunately, the chassis for this car had impurities in the metal and it had expanded and broken all apart before the car had ever been assembled. In 1939, the true model 316th O gauge die cast cattle car was released. This car was lettered for the Missouri Pacific and used a road number of 510. It was painted railroad brown and the shell was cast with open slat sides. It came with stamp seal doors that opened and a two piece brake wheel. The Missouri Pacific script and the 510 are rubber stamped in a light silver white paint while a white Missouri Pacific Lines Herald decal is applied on the right side. The car body is mounted on a tank car chassis, which has four pins that are staked with an X tool. In 1946, this car transitioned to the S gauge line and became all plastic. And the shell and the floor were separated, but both made of plastic. The number changed to 629 and the color changed as well as it became more of a maroon red plastic. The shell body continued to have open slat sides and the doors continued to open and there was also a two piece brake wheel. Unfortunately, the plastic chassis and bodies tended to work very badly. So soon into production, the plastic chassis body was replaced by a die solid die cast version. Pictured here is a 1946 number 629 with some moderate warpage and a slight side bulge. 
the hopper. In 1939, a true model 316 O gauge die cast hopper was released with number 508 and was lettered for the Virginia Railroad. The finished cars or ready to run cars were available for $4 while a kit which was labeled K-508 was available for three. These cars were painted gray and the script on the side was applied with rubber stamps. They also came with operating stamp steel bay doors. The car was a single casting and the trucks were applied on the bottom via screws. In 1946, the same castings were used, but the number was changed to 632. The hopper became available in several gray variations. And then the die cast LNE hopper was also available. In 1947, an all new plastic version was made that did not have the operating bay doors in the LNE script. The first of these were black plastic that warped very badly, but later variations came with many gray plastics. A variation to the pre-war hopper, Virginia hopper, was one that was yellow in color. This particular variation is very rare and we're fortunate to have a few pictures of this provided by Dave Clark. The caboose. It was introduced in 1939 as a true model 316th O gauge die cast caboose. The number was 516 and it was available as Union Pacific or New York Central. If you wanted to buy a ready to run car, it would cost you $4 or the kit K number 516 was available for $3. The caboose came painted in red and rubber stamping was used with silver for the part number or car number and the road name. Additionally, there were separately applied metal handrails and a smokestack. It also included a light socket and light bulb. What's also interesting is how the caboose body and chassis were attached. There were casted posts that passed through the chassis and then were kind of staked underneath. And these tend to be more inboard, which uh, differs from what most of us are familiar with, the posts being on the outside corners. Also of note in the pictures that you're looking at, the UP caboose had windows glued in. In 1946, the S gauge line was brought out with a red caboose. The road name on that was for the Redding and the number was 630. These red plastic cabooses had rubber stamped numbers and letters on them that began in silver and later changed to white. The separately applied uh, metal that we found in the pre-war also happened on the post-war. And also the under structure details were very similar in post-war as they were in pre-war. Also included was a light bulb and socket. There were plastic windows glued in to the S scale version. Unfortunately, the early plastic chassis and bodies worked fairly badly, so soon after they began production, they moved to a die cast chassis to help with that. <clears throat> Thanks so much for stopping in today, and as always, enjoy those American Flyer trains, be they three or two rail. And until next time, take care. God bless. We'll see you. Bye bye.